Yeah. Can you reload? All right. Hey, everybody. This is Jessica over at Creative Live in San Francisco, and I've got a really fun hangout for us today. I've got uh, Toby Fairley, the principal of Toby Fairley Interior Design, and Noel Turner, the editor-in-chief of House Beautiful, with me. And I'd just like to give them a chance to say hello. This is Toby. Hi. <laughs> and over here is Noel. Hey, everyone. And we're here primarily because Toby is uh, doing multiple courses with us here at Creative Live, and her last class was amazing, and her upcoming course is next week, and it's called What's Your Home Design Personality, and it starts on January 23rd, so that's next week, and you can um, go to the website right now on creativelive.com and enroll in that class if you would like. That would be awesome. And um, so I'm just going to jump in. I have a couple questions prepared for Toby and Noel, and um, let's get started. Thank you guys, first of all. You're welcome. Um, first question, and this is probably something everybody's thinking about because New Year, everyone starts thinking about new things. Um, Toby, what are the trends that you're seeing and what do you think is new or what do you think is going to be really hot for 2014? Well, I talked about trends uh, with color in my last course and I'm going to talk a little bit about style trends um, in a section next week, but just to let a couple of cats out of the bag, I guess, as they say, um, as far as color goes, you know, we heard the color of the year is radiant orchid, which is a purple color. I don't know that I that I totally believe that. I'm seeing lots of cobalt blues and moodier, richer hues like charcoal and navy, um, which I love. And then um, to some people's chagrin and amazement, I think brass is the big trend. Brass is back in a big way, and <laughs> some of it's 80s, and some of it's more chic than 80s, but I happen to love it. I've, I, it never went out for me, um, but definitely mm -hmm. seeing tons of it. I'd love to hear what Newell thinks, because they, they study this stuff, too, for the magazine. Sure. Yeah, Newell, what are you seeing? You know, I'm totally on page with you about brass. Um, you know, Chrome and nickel in particular was so big for a long time. Uh, but brass, you know, has this warmth and it really has a gleam that, that nickel and chrome don't have. And I love it right now. I actually like it two ways. I like it one where it's been lacquered and it stays really shiny and it never tarnishes. But I also like bra brass in what they call a live finish and that's unvarnished and it starts tarnishing and gets a patina to it. I mean, it's a little bit of a different look, but I love it either way. Brass is really hot right now. And then along what you just said about colors, Toby, I think, you know, it's fun to talk about crazy colors and really strong colors as being hot, but when it comes down to it, it's really more of the neutrals that are usually the hot colors. Mm -hmm. And I always like to remind people, you know, white's a color, but, you know, even within the grays and the blues, there are wonderful shades that are sort of in and out. I mean, I think, I really like colors that have a life to them. I mean, I guess it's like the brass. There are some colors and some paints in particular that um, have certain pigment formulations that make them alive and they react to the color or the light in a room. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I like it when a gray looks, let's say, warmer in the day and cooler at night on the wall. Um, but I love, I love neutrals, you know, I think there's so much you can do with neutrals and when you start mixing them, grays and creams and browns, I'm looking around my office, that's kind of my <laughs> color palette. Uh, I love that look. Great. Toby, any thoughts on that? Well, and I think, you know, a lot of people want to know about what, what neutral to choose and I think um, Newell mentioned gray several times and it's been trending for a while but I think it's really strong still. Um, we haven't circled all the way back around to a lot of those golds and tans and more yellow based colors yet. Not that any neutral doesn't work if you love it, but I'm still um, loving living in the land of grays and even beige gray, which maybe is called grayish if you want to, <laughs> but you know, all of those kinds of, um, they're warmer, as Newell said, like a warm gray. They're not cold have warmth, but they're still in that palette, I think, as opposed to being closer to the golds and yellows that we saw, you know, even maybe 10, 10 years ago or six years ago. So I'm, I'm on the gray train still. 
Right you know, Toby, Toby, you talk a lot about color personality and finding your color personality. And I'm a real blue person, so I've always liked blue. I mean, I, I, I always have something blue on me, which is a good sign that I'm going to like blue anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But I was telling someone recently, I think indigo is a really hot color right now because it's one of those colors that you find in every culture around the world. Virtually every culture has some tradition somewhere of indigo and mm -hmm. today the way people like to mix all sorts of cultural styles in a room and mm -hmm. have that sort of eclectic global style mm -hmm. indigo is a great color for that because it is kind of pan cultural there are great traditions of indigo all over the world and I think it's a really interesting color for right now excellent that, that actually um Reminds me of a question we were just we, we were talking about before, and that's you know indigo. It sounds like indigo. You could use that to tie together different styles. Um, use exactly. the color to tie it together. And what are other? Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll throw this to you first. But what what are other ways to combine? You know, maybe you have different pieces that you really love, or you know something that's been in the family for a while, and you you don't want to get rid of it. How do you throw those different pieces together and make it work? Toby, you're the decorator. Help us. <laughs> He's like, I got nothing. <laughs> okay, well, um, I definitely think, you know, the way, and of course we'll definitely talk about this in our, in our course about style and how to unify styles, but it's about finding that common thread like you were talking about. So it can be a color, uh, it can be a material, it can be a metal, it can be a finish. Uh, if you're talking about furniture, it can be a period. Um, there's all sorts of things. It's, it's more about finding um, something that I say, I call like a point of reference um, that can make sense and sort of, you know, ha be that common bond between pieces. So a lot of times for me it is color. Um, and you could take, you know, a color in a, um, if you were blending styles or, you know, I guess which we may talk about in a few minutes, you could um, use a color element like on a drapery or on a pillow and um, brings, you know, an accessory that you picked up when traveling that all had maybe like Newell said indigo in it and they could suddenly work together in a way that maybe individually w you wouldn't have really thought about them working uh, together. And and on the idea of indigo, I totally agree. I, I just posted a blog yesterday on, on, I mean, a post on my blog and I was asking people blue or green because I'm working on a new house and I just posed the question. I've never gotten so many comments on my blog in my life to say, should I do a green sofa or a blue sofa? And it was so fun to hear uh, what everybody thought. But but I agree with Newell and I even spoke in the course we taught on color and about the history of design. You know, indigo as a pigment uh, had, came about hundreds of years ago and it's been in all sorts of colors and geographic regions. So I think you're exactly right and you could see it in any place from Morocco or Egypt all the way to like colonial Williamsburg. So it, it is kind of that exactly. almost neutral that ties it all together. Okay. Yeah, you know, as editor-in-chief of House Beautiful, let me say right now, I only know the tricks that I learned from people like Toby. <laughs> you know, I have a big bag of tricks that I've collected over the years as an editor. And one thing I learned recently, kind of picking up on what Toby said about finding a key color, you know, I learned this trick recently. If you find one color you like and you want to use it in a room, then stay very close to that color. Use that color, but don't stay with just that one color. Go a shade above or a shade below and kind of layer those shades around that one color in the room. So you might go a little lighter on the wall, go a darker shade on the sofa, but stay all right in the family around that one color that you like. And what it does is it gives you this kind of cohesive look, but it's not flat. It'd be really flat if you use the same color on everything in the room, but you get this dimension and depth by going just a shade above or below the favorite color. Great. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, great. Okay, let's <laughs> go to the... Thank you, guys. Let's go to the next question. Um, so everyone is curious, and I know, Toby, this is this is a big part of your your class coming up next week is, is how do I find my personal style? Like how do I even get started to try to figure that out? Um, so I think it's an, it's almost like finding out anything else about yourself. Like when you're, you know, I think about this from uh, dieting to self-help to finding your personal style. You have to become really self-aware and start paying attention 
to um, what you're drawn to emotionally and, and then start sort of almost for me making a science of it so if you see a piece of art that you love or um, a fabric that you love or a color that you love um, start making note of it or collecting them if they're physical items in a box or creating a Pinterest board so that you can then take a step back later and look at all of them together and start saying what is it that each of these things have in common um, and you can start really finding a lot of cues about yourself and your style and, and usually I think it's that um, it's sort of almost more from the gut uh, to me it's like what your have a visceral reaction to in a good way what makes you happy what makes you feel relaxed um, and you can start just sort of not being too critical of them as you collect them put them all in one pay place and then draw them all out and go what is it that I love about these oh I had no idea I'm drawn to all these rooms that have you know white walls or I'm drawn to all of these rooms that have uh, a mid-century piece of furniture in it or that have you know a lot of windows in the architecture and you'll start to see some common threads through um, the things that you're collecting that maybe you didn't even notice before. Right on. That's so yeah. true. That is so true. You know, you can do it really easily on Pinterest, but also, you know, before the digital world got so big, just tearing out of magazines mm -hmm. and throwing them in a shoebox and then going back and pulling it all out. I've done this before myself. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you kind of go, it's, it's like therapy. All of a sudden, it's like really obvious what you like because you'll find that you've torn a lot of similar things that have the just been thing. appealing to you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Same thing over it, and over. I, I think it's kind of like um, finding what your personal style, your fashion style is because, you know, when you're not paying attention and then all of a sudden you go in your closet and you go, oh, my gosh, I didn't realize I had bought four purple shirts or, you know, three pairs of green shoes or something it's or this style of sneakers or boots and, and it's it's that kind of idea of just starting to pay attention to um, and then asking yourself questions about it's really the education piece like I don't know why I like these let me learn more about what they are whether it's a sofa or chair style or if it's a a textile or you know is it a, are you drawn to floral prints or are you drawn to clean lined furniture or or things that are more um, European or fussy or have skirts on them as far as sofas you know you're gonna see some things and start becoming aware that wow I'm really influenced by um, this style uh, in a more than I thought great um, and I know for sure you'll be talking about that in the class that's, yes mm -hmm. that's a big piece of it great um, next question is uh, it's, it's it's similar, but it's it's a little bit different. It's it's what happens. How do you work together with someone else? You know, this happens a lot, I think, with roommates and and when uh, partners move in together. Um, what's a good strategy to collaborate and work with someone who has a different style than you do? Toby, you want to go first? Okay. Yeah. Um. Well, um, as a designer, we do this a lot. It's it's kind of like um you know well you're right designing for spouses and partners and roommates and um, and we're kind, we kind of become the therapist and the mediator and the the attorney I don't know all of those things but um, what I find that is helpful is first of all I have people make a list of what their priorities are and what their sort of non-negotiables like you can't have everything. You're going to have to compromise. So what are maybe your three or four things that you're just not willing to get rid of or change or move that are really important to you? Because, you know, each person has to compromise a bit. And then also in the same way we just said put things in a collection and then start analyzing what's, what the common threads are, you're probably going to find there are some elements that are similar that you could build around between both of your um things your your collections or your you know belongings or things that are sentimental to you and then also maybe each person has certain areas that are there so it's kind of like giving my husband a room in the house where he can put his things or I have a room that's like my yoga room there's a few spaces that really kind of get to be ours that we get to do what we sort of want to with or make them a little bit more unique to us so it's kind of it's kind of a sharing sort of th where you get your own space but you also collaborate in shared spaces right yeah mm -hmm. Newell, did you have any any thoughts on that or 
I don't know. I think think (laughs) Dr. Toby just summed it all up pretty good. (laughs) It did feel a little little therapy. I think you probably have to do that a lot. Definitely. Oh, most designers, I think, would consider ourselves um, maybe 10% creative, 40% um, therapist, and 50% (laughs) entrepreneur or something. I don't know. But there's a huge piece of it that's definitely the, the therapy piece. That's awesome. Okay. Um, anything else on that one? We'll move on. We got a couple more, and then we'll take some audience from uh, questions from oh, the audience. I do, I do actually oh. have one. Sure. Yeah. Go for um, it. You know, I, I forgot to say this, but a lot of times it's a matter of actually getting. At, I mean, whether you hire a professional or you get a third party, sometimes it's a it's a matter of having a, a neutral party actually help you make some of those decisions because you get really emotionally attached to things sometimes. Uh, yeah. Just sort of trying to to win the fight or, you know, stand your ground. So so don't forget that, that we're out here, professionals, and you can certainly hire us or read our blogs and get help there too. Definitely. I know uh, just personally when I had a closet revamp and I hired a stylist to help me with that, just having her say, that is terrible, please, for the love of God, throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> Donate yeah. that to Goodwill. You know, it was it was step just away from the, the whatever. Yeah, <laughs> the permission that, that that she gave me to do that was very very freeing. So that's definitely the therapy side. Um, great. Um, I got so yeah, a couple more, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, and this is something I'm really curious to hear. Uh, do either of you have aside from you know you both produce lovely content in this in this field. Where else do you go? Do you use a specific app on your phone or do you have websites that you just always are going to um, when you are trying to be inspired design wise? Toby, you want to go first? Okay. Uh, I mean of course I mean how could any of us live these days without Pinterest? <laughs> uh, or even before that, I mean just Google. My daughter thinks that Google is the solution to everything. She's eight. Uh, she's like, Mom, just Google it. So, um, you know, <laughs> certainly we're, we're out there. Um, but I think, I mean, for me, not not to um, not to try to butter Newell up, but certainly sites like House Beautiful, and I don't know if you're following House Beautiful on Twitter, but they have a, a great conversation going on on Twitter all the time, which I love. It inspires me, and they're asking people questions. They're talking about what kind of flowers to use. They're talking about um, trends, they're talking about sofa style, so I, I love to follow along in that conversation and they give really beautiful visuals um, and examples of, of, you know, that support their conversation. Okay. Any apps that you use, Toby? Um, apps, I'm trying to think. I mean, you know, for me personally, I love to use Instagram uh, because I, that's a great place to capture, particularly when you're drawn to something like I was talking about earlier. So if you're analyzing your style and maybe even before you make purchases, if you're collecting images and being really creative with Instagram, it's a fun place to refer back to. Um, I, when I travel, when I go to High Point Market, when I go to Europe, when I go to the flower market, anywhere, I take tons and tons of pictures. And sometimes I just refer back to them when I'm looking for inspiration for a project. It's like a little um, encyclopedia of beautiful things for me. So that's one of my favorites. Great. Uh, Noel, did you have any sites that you're always going to or apps that you really enjoy? Well, I'll just reiterate a couple of things and expand on one thing. Um, you know, don't forget your phone has a camera, and I just take pictures like crazy. Mm-hmm. And then I edit out. I don't let it just keep getting so big. I'll take more for fear of not getting something, and then before I, you know, back it up on the computer, edit out what I don't really want to keep. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also, and I love Pinterest. I mean, I'm really using Pinterest a lot for things personally. But I also love Instagram because unlike Facebook, it's out of control. I mean, I can't keep up with the variety of people and the, the layers of conversations that start happening, business and personal. It's a lot. But Instagram, I find really just stimulating. I follow a few people whose eye I find really interesting. And I've, at least so far, I've kind of kept control over it, so I'm not following too many people. And you know, you'd think that I look at stuff all day long. So you'd think at the end of the day, I'd be sick of looking at things. But I actually get home and I just like to scroll through and look at the visuals that people have put on Instagram because uh, I found some really 
I think there's some people that wake up in the morning and just see beautiful things from the moment they get out of the bed. And I'm fascinated by that. Um, you know, to plug House Beautiful, we have an Instagram feed too that's, that's really cool. Actually, all three of our magazines, House Beautiful, Veranda, and El Decor, have three very different approaches on Instagram. And so, you know, if you don't know where to start, that's a good place to start. And then you'll start running across people who have an eye that you connect to, that you identify with, and you follow those people. Toby, you know, do, do you agree? I think mm -hmm. you can just find some of those amazing things through Instagram. I, I can't Im imagine a world without it now. <laughs> yeah, I think there's some people, like you said, that just have a, a talent for almost constantly seeing the world like it's through a camera's lens, and they have a way of photographing things as little vignettes or as a detail and I, I, just the composition of the photographs sometimes to me are as beautiful as what they're photographing and there's beautiful food there's so much it's just um, it's kind of a, a sensory overload in a good way without without noise without a lot of words and and text that you can get a lot of times on like like you were saying on Facebook and other places that just become distracting it's just really beautiful yeah yeah sometimes they're like little mini magazines when people have a very particular point of view or interest and that's what they kind of focus their Instagram feed on it's like getting a little mini magazine live I love it I agree little curated lists of peeking inside of their brain mm -hmm. <laughs> Love it. Great. Um, so the last question, and then we'll throw to the audience. Um, you know, it's, it's the beginning of the year. We all have, you know, big piles of New Year's resolutions. And, you know, I know every year on my list is I want to declutter. And I don't know if either of you have either personal tips or, like, your own best practice for just kind of simplifying and clearing out um, your space. Toby, you want to go first? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Ladies first. I feel like I'm dominating the conversation. <laughs> Sorry, Noel. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big New Year's resolutions or even intentions kind of person, like a daily intentions person. And I'm also a person that is really comfortable um, getting rid of things that aren't really serving me. So I love to give new homes to things that maybe, you know, repurpose or let someone else find a use for things that I'm not using. So I think um, one of the best tips is to do that often. I mean, I would say once a quarter or so if you can, uh, or either take a room a month and, you know, go through it and organize. I think it has to be a constant process. It's even like in our design workroom, you know, at least once a quarter we're weeding through samples and fabrics and things and, and moving things on that we're not using. Um, I also think if you don't love it, let someone else be have the benefit of enjoying it. So there's a lot of people that keep things that maybe they're emotionally attached to them, but not because they love it. So when I'm working with a client and trying to help them weed through, because my rooms are pretty edited, uh, especially as, as far as knickknacks and things go, um, we, we go through this process and we say, okay, is this something that you'll, you'll use once in a while, like at a party for entertaining, it was your mother's or something, keep it, but let's find a place to store it. And if you're never going to use it, don't feel guilty giving it a new home. You know, because I'll, people have things, maybe they just have a hundred things from their mother. And I say, pick your favorite three or four that have true meaning for you and then move the others on to someone else. So um, mm -hmm. a lot of people feel guilt associated with things and I try to help them understand you, you've, you've, um, you've been loyal and you've been gracious by showcasing these few pieces it doesn't mean you have to do that for every piece. Great. Uh, Noel, anything to add? Well, I, I use this trick. I, have a, I keep a couple of boxes in my basement, and they're sort of destination boxes. So one is for the town sale. My town has an annual yard sale. One is for the parish sale. My parish has an annual sale. <laughs> and then one is for family. Um, so I kind of keep these three boxes in the basement. They say it. And I just try to move things to those boxes. And the nice thing about it, you can put it in there and you're not getting rid of it right away. You can come back and reconsider <laughs> and take it back out again before it really goes. <laughs> but it does help you kind of get things moving. So, and then when you're ready to dispose of it, it's all in a box ready to just go. You don't have to kind of, it doesn't become a big project. That's the hurdle for me. 
if I kind of keep things kind of going all the time um, and collecting, then you know it's an easy job to get rid of it, and I can move it on out before I reconsider anything. But that's my little trick. Yeah, that's a good one. Great. Well, we've got a bunch of questions from the audience, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start with uh, one from Elizabeth, who says. Uh, who's asking, how do you stay ahead of trends so that you are the one saying that brass is now in rather than falling behind it? Um, either one of you can grab that. Um, I think it's, it's kind of it's kind of like finding antiques or you know good deals at a store. You have to be working on it constantly. You have to be out there. So one of the reasons that designers are sort of those tastemakers and trendsetters is because we're the ones constantly going to market, reading magazines, paying attention and analyzing maybe what our peers are doing and noticing when someone uses a cool color combination. Um, paying attention and then noticing when it kind of crops up again. It, it's about um, it's about awareness, kind of like I was saying earlier about your own style. You have to pay attention. And since we're naturally detail people, a lot of times we're really zoning in on some of those things. Um, also, um, I mean, I think trends because we're constantly trying to stay as a profession on the forefront, which Newell is too. Um, we we are a little more daring to try things a lot faster than other people. So you have to be willing to take a chance knowing some of them aren't going to work. You're going to fail sometimes, but you have to, if you're not trying stuff often, if you're waiting until everybody else has done the trying for you, you're already behind the trend, I guess. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and if you're going to fail, fail with style. <laughs> go, go, exactly. go all out and fail in a big grand way. You know. Love it. Style and trends cycle so fast now. You know, I was thinking when I was talking about brass a minute ago, okay, <laughs> as I say brass, 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 you know, nickel's probably coming around the corner really fast. <laughs> but, you know, I think it comes back to what Toby was talking about and is actually going to talk about in her color programs. And that's just find something that feels good to you and be true to what feels good to you and love it. And and then you know what? Maybe you become the leader instead of the follower as you lead some, you know, it, I think when you really love something, you set an example for other people and you create this passion for other people because they see your passion for it. And I think, you know, instead of worrying about trends, I would just find something you love and be true to it. You know, I also encourage you to come to House Beautiful because it <laughs> is, like Toby said, our job to kind of look, 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 look and mm -hmm. make sense of it for people. And I think we do a pretty good job of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, pick up House Beautiful or come to us on the web or, you know, anything like that and see what we're talking about because we're, we try to stay ahead of the curve and we're usually pretty good about it. Great. Um, we have a great question. Um, so Rebecca asks, um, I have a question about that fabulous photo at the top of our web page. And... Uh, Toby, it's that photo you used to promote our last course, your last course, which has the indigo sofa with the orange wing chair and the pillows. That's my that well, that was my living room until I moved about three months ago. So oh, awesome. Um, and she's asking, unfortunately, uh, or she says it wouldn't to me be half of what it is without the fabulous burst of tulips on the coffee table. Mm -hmm. And she said, mm. unfortunately, I don't have the time or disposable income to replace tulips every week or, or other flowers. Mm -hmm. What what's another way I can get that fresh vertical? colorful impact that, that really makes all the difference um, in finishing I mean, space. There's, even though they're not inexpensive, there are some really beautiful artificial flowers um, out there in the world these days. I mean, they have perfect, sometimes you can't even tell the difference. Two of my um, team members that work for me on my staff have purchased artificial flowers from a couple of companies and their spouses have watered them. They look so real, <laughs> honestly. Like you can tell. So um, they're not cheap, actually, but as opposed to buying, you know, six dozen fresh tulips every three days to have that look <laughs> on my coffee table, certainly, you know, within a few months, you would they would pay for themselves. And, and, and you get what you pay for. So uh, investing in good quality, no matter what it is that you're buying, I think is always a great tip. Um, you know, there... I also just pick up fresh flowers all the time, and I noticed the other day, one of those conversations on Twitter really was about flowers that you guys were having on 
um, house beautiful, but I think even when you're just, you know, wheeling through the fresh market with your cart, picking up whatever they have at a good price and bringing them home adds so much color and life. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You know, I want to add to that too. I mean, these are some tricks that we use at the magazine. You know, you can pick up a little bouquet of flowers at the grocery store because most big grocery stores now have a little flower department. They're usually pretty inexpensive. But the trick is to pick those up, then come home with a pair of clippers and go out in your yard and just cut anything you see that looks pretty. Vines in particular are great because they can really make um, some simple flowers kind of come to life because they've got a lot of movement. But buy, you know, spend a little bit of money on something fresh and then go out in your yard and just clip away at the bushes and hedges and vines. And we've been, we've been even known to go to neighbors and snip a little bit. But you have to Uh-oh. be careful about that. <laughs> Uh-oh. One other, thing thing about, one other thing about artificial flowers, though, too, another trick with that, and I do that here in my office, is I have three, di- it, not for every season, but I have three different artificial flower bouquets, and they make really beautiful ones now. Mm-hmm. And one's in, on my desk in the spring and summer. One, uh, spring, one is on in the uh, summer and fall, and then one is on in the winter. It's, it's a white orchid arrangement in the winter. It's white hydrangeas in the summer and pink peonies in the spring. And, you know, when you rotate them, they start feeling fresh. They don't really feel so fake <laughs> because you don't look at them all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's one of those little tricks. You, you know, if you just rotate things, back to what Toby was saying about stuff in your house, don't put it out and leave it there forever. Rotate stuff so that your eye is always kind of engaged and never bored. Great. And uh, Rebecca's asking a follow-up um, that she is, she, I think she seems a little surprised that you think artificial flowers are not tacky. But I think it sounds like maybe there's been some technology applied to artificial flowers recently, and, and she might want to look into that, is what I'm yes, hearing from you. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, listen. Um, it, it, I was going to say, they are everywhere. You know, you can go to Pottery Barn. They have fantastic uh, artificial flowers. Um, mm. I think the ones that are che- really cheap and sort of falling apart, those are the ones you don't want to get. Mm-hmm. Uh, or that look really fake and like shiny and silky, too silky. Mm-hmm. But they're great and, ones out there. Well, and, and I think another trick is to take cues from real floral designs. So it's been a trend for several years. Even you'll notice in magazines to maybe use all one type of flower, um, kind of like Noel was saying. So. Um, when you look at artificial arrangements, like he was saying, that maybe are a whole bunch of pink peonies cut really short and paved in a vase that look mimic a true beautiful fresh flower arrangement. That's completely different than what we used to see uh, in artificial flowers. It's almost the difference um, in what wallpaper used to be versus what wallpaper is now. And people go, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe you love wallpaper again!" And they're thinking of these hideous vinyl things that they couldn't get off the wall. You know, there's been a ton of technology and design across the board, and the things that look the best are the ones that really um, have quality, and then, like we said, in the flowers that really mimic something that looks fresh. Excuse me. Um, thank you, guys. Sorry, I had a little, a little tickle. Get your style as it grows without blowing your budget. Every time you want to change things up. Did you hear that, Newell? I think we we ha- she's yeah. having a little a little yeah. cough. Well, yeah, let's keep talking because you know okay. I think I think you should think of your style as an ongoing thing, and I would never want to be done decorating because it's too much fun. So I think actually I was listening to a lecture by uh, uh, an English decorator, Nina Campbell, the other day. And she said, you know, so many people make the mistake of going in and feeling like they need to buy everything right then and get it all done at once. And then they miss out on the fun of looking and exploring and eventually finding that right thing to put on the fireplace or over on a table by the sofa. You know, leave some holes to fill and then have fun looking, you know, as you live. Yeah, and I agree. People, um, the conversation I've been having on my blog, because it's what's happening in my life, is that I did just buy a new house 
in September, and it's a definite fixer-upper. And so I've been starting to show the pictures on my blog, and, and so many people have commented, oh, my gosh, why did you move? Everything was so beautiful before. Um, but for me, that is what's most fun is to, you know, have a house, love it, enjoy it, and then move on and use my furniture in different ways, move them into different rooms, recover a few things, bring things out, like you said, of the cupboard that maybe I forgot I had, and suddenly they're the things that get showcased on the, the coffee table, and I forgot how much I loved them, or I remember when we picked them up on a trip, and my husband and I bought it together or something. You know, so it, it is more much more fun um, to constantly be evolving in your style and, and um, you know, enjoying new things or different things. I agree. Great. Um, next question from Christina. When designing a living room, which piece do you start with? A big couch, a big item like a couch or a rug and then work around it? How do you get started? Um, well, for me, I pick the piece that's most inspiring. So a lot of times I start projects with um, something colorful like a fabric because that's what I really love. Uh, and I decided what it's going to go on. Is it going to be the drapery? Is it going to be um, a pillow on the sofa, um, an antique chair that's going to be recovered? Or maybe it's, um, maybe it's not a fabric. Maybe it's a, a piece of art or a bowl or something that I picked up somewhere that I'm really excited about. So I usually let one really um, exciting and colorful piece set the tone, and then I layer in all those other pieces behind it. And of course, most of your stuff in your room is the big neutral sofa or maybe even a neutral wall paint, but um, it would kind of be a little boring to start there, and it would be hard to stay inspired along the way. So I say start with the most exciting piece. Newell, did you have anything? Uh, well, you know, I was going to say most of us usually have something already that we have and we need to, we, we, we're not starting without anything. So, you know, if it's the rug that you have, start with the rug and maybe find the color palette to build the rest of the room out of the rug. Or, you know, even a piece of art. You know, you could start with a piece of art that you love and let that art kind of dictate where you go with your color palette. Don't you think, Toby? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's whatever. And I talk a lot about that in finding your color inspiration in the last course. Um, but it's the, the same is true whether you're looking for colors or you're looking for uh, the sofa. I think certainly, yeah, find a piece uh, and let it be the jumping off point. And that way um, it keeps you from getting confused. Pick either the, the largest piece or your, the, your favorite piece, the most important piece, um, and then you just layer in a piece at a time until you have this kind of layered and collected look like we've been talking about. And it's so much more interesting. Um, than trying to make it all go together. What you don't want is to look like you went down to the local furniture showroom and bought the entire place and brought it to your living room all at, at the same time. That's that's not what you're looking for. Yeah, please never do that. It's it's no fun <laughs> either. You know, and, and you know another thing about finding color too. Someone or woman once told me that you know sometimes if you just stop, like you were saying earlier, Toby, look in your closet and look at the clothes that you have. Sometimes things that you already have will dictate where you should go with it. Um, but I think, you know, a room should reflect who you are in the same way that you dress. You should create your room to look like you. And I, while I do have to kind of make decisions about what we want to publish and not publish, <coughs> I never think about things as good and bad. I, I think more like, does this work for us and what we want to do right now? Because I don't ever want to fall into the trap of, saying someone's look is no good because it is their expression and, and I respect that and I think the more personal you are, the more personal you make your room and the more personal you decorate, the better it's going to be because um, I think we all have some natural instincts somewhere inside. We like to say at House Beautiful, everybody has a beautiful in ho a house inside of them <laughs> and we're here to help you find it by showing you great examples of good work and great examples of beautiful rooms. And, and getting back to what we said earlier, the more you look, the more you educate yourself by looking at things, the more you'll understand what works for you and the more you un you'll understand what you like and what you want to surround yourself with. Great. 
Um, we got we got a couple more questions from the audience. Betty says um, asks what role does new original art play in setting or supporting trends? Whoever is new, new original art. Correct. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know about setting trends as much as it's just important to create um, a home that reflects your unique style. Um, I think artwork is very, very personal, and of course, some people collect uh, for investment purposes, or you know, they want to have certain artists in their collection. But most of us just buy things that move us, that make us happy, or that remind us of of something, um, a time or a trip or something. So I think it's more about um, maybe not as much tr being trendy as it is just um, being personal and unique. Amen. <laughs> Excellent. What she right. said. <laughs> Basically, I just say whatever Toby said is really like, that's the right. That's Noel right and I, is. we've always been on the same page. That's why we're working together here. We 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 exactly. already. We're, we're already in sync. Well, you know, I always like to, I always like to see Toby's work because you know, <laughs> as a designer, you're working with clients, and you are trying to capture their sensibility. But what I think you're able to do is to get people to go a little further than they might have gone on their own and be a little more bold with their color choices, mm -hmm. and you can discover that color is not so frightening once you live with it. In fact, I think people find when they do make go a little bit outside of their uh, comfort zone with color, that they can find that suddenly it didn't seem so far at all, you know. And Toby, your rooms, I mean, you're you're gutsy with color, and Thank you. but I but I've never seen anything fall apart either. I mean, you wow. have an ability to kind of tie things together, like that picture that they were referring to earlier. It's really bold and beautiful and I think that you know those rooms can make you feel so happy when you're in them. Well, thank you. Those were huge compliments. So thank you so much. But I, I think um, what I um, what I guess what I'm most proud of that you mentioned is that um, I do help people. I take a little bit of the fear out of embracing color and maybe help people understand that not all color choices are permanent. Uh, it's not that hard to repaint a wall or to switch out a, a, some sofa, I mean some pillows on the sofa. But even when you're making big purchases, I've had very, uh, I, I can't recall a single client who's ever said, oh my gosh, I'm so tired of that bright red sofa or that cobalt sofa or something daring. But I've had many, many people say, oh my gosh, I'm so tired of living in a sea of brown or <laughs> I'm beige to death or I'm tan to death. So people, you know, really are moved by color. And I think um, they actually end up a lot happier when they um, maybe push the envelope a little bit. They become proud of themselves that they could take the leap and it makes them love it even that much more. Yeah. Awesome. Um, great, great question. Great answers. Um, Deborah's asking, do you find... Um, it more budget friendly to reupholster more often, or to buy more new pieces. Um, I guess she's looking at at some budget tips to try to change up a room. Yeah, I mean that gets a little tricky. I just had this conversation with a, a client, a new client today. It's been a, that's been a friend of mine for a long time, and we're just starting a project. And she has some pieces, some that aren't even very old, but she's just not really happy with the fabric choices, and so. Um, we were having this conversation. Do we recover or do we just buy new? Well, it depends on a lot of things. It depends on the uh, the fabric. I mean, sometimes uh, the fabric itself, if it's if it's expensive, can be more expensive than the entire you know buying a whole new sofa all by itself, just the fabric. Um, it's there's so many different qualities that we're talking about. It's hard to compare apples to apples. So. Um, sometimes you could go out and buy an entirely new sofa less expensive than re reupholstering, but is it as good as the quality of the piece that you already owned? And usually my rule of thumb for clients is if this is the most comfortable sofa or chair that you've ever owned in your life and you've just told me how much you loved it, I'm not going to take a chance on getting rid of it and hoping that a new piece is that comfortable or that the lines are right or that the scale is perfect. I'm going to probably, if it's in good quality, just go ahead and recover it because we already like what we're working with. It's kind of the, if it's not broke thing, um, you know, maybe it just needs to be 
uh, have a little facelift, then that's when we're going to go ahead and, uh, and re reupholster it. But it gets tricky because both can be expensive. Um, but you get what you pay for, and they can last a long time if it's great quality. Okay. And if you can reuse something like that, it's also a very green thing to do. You know, sofas are large pieces of furniture, and if you're not giving it to someone else to use, it's going in a landfill and That's taking right. up a lot of space. So mm -hmm. if it's still a good functioning piece of furniture, either try to redo it in some way that works for you, or make sure it goes to someone else that could enjoy it and take advantage of it. Because um, you now we have to think that way, and I think the more we think about green at that level the more effective we become overall uh, in a green way. I, I agree completely and, and just um, kind of as my own personal philosophy because I'm sure this, I don't know that I've ever told anybody this but I, it would probably be interesting for people to know that p pieces of furniture in my house, many of them have been recovered many times already. So if I move to a new house and have to use things in a different room, I'm not tossing out and getting new. I mean, I have chairs, and you know, I'm, I'm early 40s, and I have some chairs that I've recovered three times already, depending on, you know, maybe some didn't hold up as well as others. You know, when my daughter was young, maybe it was that I needed a color change because we moved to a new house. But, but um, most upholstery that's good quality can be recovered many times, uh, and you don't have to toss it out. So I agree with Noel. I'm constantly... Um, reinventing things. <laughs> you know, I just wrote an editor's letter a few issues ago about my sofa uh, because I walked in one day in, to my apartment and I looked at my sofa and I was like, oh my gosh, it's seen better days. <laughs> but I'm, I've become so attached to this sofa, I can't get rid of it. So I've, I've re-slip covered it three times. <laughs> um, I think, though, it may have met its end, though, because it's really... It, or at least I'm going to have to do a big overhaul on it because the padding is really kind of going on it. But I don't know. I tend to get attached to things <laughs> like pets. And this sofa has like seen me through a lot of good and bad times. And <laughs> I can't bear the thought of seeing it out on the street in New York waiting for the dump truck to come pick it up. I, I'm going to have to, if it has to go, it's going to have to go when I'm not there because I can't watch that. Oh, no. <laughs> and that's the perfect example of why designers have to be therapists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I need you to I'm you to have come to visit. do a, I need to do a sofa intervention with you <laughs> after we get off this call. Oh my gosh, I want to film this. This needs to be part of your creative live course. The the sofa intervention. I love Design it. Design intervention. <laughs> it's your reality TV show, right, Toby? Exactly. <laughs> okay, okay, got a couple more questions and then we're just about out of time. Uh, Deborah had a second question. She said, um, "What are your top three like quick room updates? You know, a pillow, lamp, art book. Like, what are the the top three things that will really help a room uh, look updated or refreshed?" Do you want me? No, you can go no, first this no, time. No, you have to go first. <laughs> I'll give you. I'll give you three tips that we use uh, for styling, but they're also really good quick updates to a room. One and this requires buying something, are throw pillows. You know, switching out the throw pillows on your sofa or your chairs or even on your bed can almost instantly change the personality. And, you know, you can find, you can find great throw pillows pretty much anywhere. Uh, all the shops, even HSN has great throw pillows, believe it or not. They have some fantastic ones, as a matter of fact. Really inexpensive, and you can watch it on, online and order them and have them delivered. Um, but throw pillows, changing the throw pillows is a really quick way to update the look of a room. Uh, the other thing is something we just talked about, flowers. Flowers will brighten and bring life to a room immediately. Even if it's just a simple bouquet of flowers you cut from the yard. Daffodils in the spring, even branches uh, have a lot of drama and look beautiful. Autumn branches, blo uh, blooming branches, or just green branches in the summer. Um, and then the third thing, oh my gosh, I'm losing my track, what I was going to say. Oh, the <laughs> third thing is, um, like flowers, a simple bowl of fruit or something like that is a great way to refresh a room. Um, I like, I'm going to add one more thing too, paint. Paint is the easiest thing and the quickest way to change everything. And sometimes you just need a fresh coat of paint on the walls. I think people... Uh, go too long sometimes and, and don't realize, you know what, I just need to get the walls painted again. But 
if you decide to paint your walls, try a color next time. Try something a little bit different uh, because really color and paint can change things like overnight. Okay. Any other, any other tips, Toby? Well, when Nelson jumped in with his number four, he stole my brilliant idea, which was paint. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I certainly agree with him. Pillows, for sure, they're so easy. And you can have, like Newell changes his flowers on his desk, you can have summer pillows, you can have fall pillows, you can have winter pillows. Um, you can pick them up in, you know, inexpensive places, Target, TJ Maxx, like he said, home shopping. They're everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and it's fun. Um, you, you can feel, even if you don't fancy yourself a designer, um, how wrong can you really go buying a couple of, Pillows, so it kind of gives you confidence to do your own decorating for sure. So paint, pillows, um, and then think, look at details like lampshades or um, you know little elements sometimes that can really update a space. So or adding a trim onto something like I'll take paper lampshades and add grow grain ribbon on the top and the bottom of them or you know you can even add trim on the bottom of a sofa. Literally, even my own upholsterer sometimes uses like you know, an adhesive tape or a glue gun to add a little trim to something. So not, I'm not suggesting that we become totally crafty because those can go awry sometimes, but there are some little tips like that that you can do on your own um, that spice things up and um, just give a little punch of energy to your space. Great. And we're almost done. i got one more question. Um, Loretta asks, uh, what is a product that you find really durable that people think is fragile or vice versa? A product for what? I think for for design. One of the things that comes to my mind, because I feel like I have this conversation every single week, um, <laughs> and it's that people are afraid to use marble countertops. Mm -hmm. And um, we're just, I mean, people are just terrified of using marble. And so yesterday I was at a client, went out to the um, marble and granite yard with a client, and we selected slabs for her new kitchen. Uh, and we went through the whole conversation again about the fear of using marble. And the interesting thing is, is there's a new product by DuPont that they'll put on top of marble and it has a lifetime warranty. So I thought that was pretty clever from a technology standpoint. But I think there are some things that, um, I don't know if it's the consumer, if it's other contractors and people in the industry that are afraid of liability, but we create this fear factor around a lot of things um, that maybe is a little bit overboard and I mean you have to know yourself if you have four kids and and you're having parties with red wine every other night maybe white marbles not for you but for the most part I haven't found um, some material a lot of the materials people are afraid of to really be that problematic okay um, anything else we're at, we're at the end of our, our time and we're at the end of our questions which is perfectly matched which rarely happens so nicely done um, thank you both so much for for joining us this afternoon um, and don't forget everybody Toby's course on creative live is is next week um, starting the 23rd it's what's your home design personality uh, any any parting words from from either one of you well, Newell, I'll call you in about 10 minutes for that sofa intervention, okay? <laughs> and I, I would just want to add, you know, make your home yours, you know. Make your home pretty the way you want it to look. And, you know, don't worry about anything else beyond that. Is Make your home pretty and enjoy living where you live. I think that's the most important lesson we could learn in design and decorating is just make it pretty, make it what you think is pretty and enjoy being there. Perfect. Well, thank I you agree. Both. I agree. <laughs> thank you both so much. Bye bye. Um, bye. Have a great day and see you on bye. Creative Live. All right. Thanks. <laughs>